July 1st, 2024. Happy Canada Day to anyone celebrating that, and Happy Cannabis Day to anyone celebrating that. I'm Darren Rudder, or Drutter, and I have a few things to say about my close personal friend and fellow cannabis freedom activist, Neil Magnuson, who recently passed away. And this tribute to Neil would have been sooner, but I myself have been dealing with serious health problems and uh, my heart has just not been uh, beating properly, I guess we can say, for the past couple of weeks. So I uh, just have not been able to physically <clears throat> sit down and record something. But I've been thinking about him and um, I have a lot to say. <laughs> And it's going to be unscripted. I'm going to miss stuff. I'll probably ramble. And um, but uh, I feel it will be more genuine that way than to write up a speech and say that. Um, I put some images on the screen that were taken by me over the past several years. And I just want to talk about who he was, his legacy, and um, I'll intersperse that with some of my own personal experiences with him mixed in. So this will all be from my perspective, of course. This isn't a full overview of Neil, but this is how I know him, how I see him. And uh, I don't suppose anyone's going to be interested in this, so that's fine. I'm just, well, this is sort of my own therapy, uh, therapy, sorry, I guess. So I'm just going to just let it rip. Um, and uh, yeah, so sorry if I do get emotional. He was my best living friend, um, like felt like an uncle or older brother to me, and uh, we were close for ten years. And yeah, he was uh, he was a personal hero of mine. So um, if I do get you know blubbery, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna pr try and push through it and not re-record it just to keep it real. And so first, what happened? Um, Neil, for his whole life, as far as I know, at least back to when he was a teen, suffered from throat problems and swallowing problems. He had something wrong with his esophagus or his throat. Um, and he never, he sought diagnosis a few times over the years, but just never got a lot of help with it. He also had a problem with vomiting. I remember he had, um, he had like horrible vomiting uh, episodes sometimes. And, but he, you know, he was overall, other than that, healthy and so he just had this throat thing sort of all his life and um, I remember him dealing with it multiple times you know while we were close and everything and when I lived in Vancouver and him talking about it on the phone since then when I've been living um, in other parts of BC but uh, something happened about a year ago and I guess it's you know it might have been one of those turbo cancers kind of thing but he something just it just changed from being a small problem that sort of affected him sometimes to all the time and he could not swallow uh, so he had to you know he was only drinking liquids and shakes and that kind of thing and um, losing weight and getting weak and um, so doctors offered him chemo and radiation but they told him that it would probably not be what would, <laughs> would really help him it would not fix the problem and it may just uh, prolong things a little bit and uh, so considering that and knowing how damaging and painful and debilitating chemo and radiation are, he just chose to uh, treat it other ways <clears throat> as best he could. And um, so it was about a year, I think, since diagnosis. It was a fast one. And he went downhill quickly. And uh, he kept his spirits up. Um, when I talked to him on the phone, he was planning things and not talking about dying. <laughs> But that's uh, not how it went. <clears throat> um, so a celebration of life has been held. Uh, I'll put a link below. It was recorded, so you can check it out if you're interested. Um, I haven't watched much of it yet. I just want to do this first. This is my own, <laughs> my own perspective, my own thoughts, and then I'll, then I'll look at what other people have said about it. Um, yeah, and I will use my notes here uh, to frame this next part, uh, who Neil is, and what he means to cannabis activism, what he means to Vancouver <laughs> and British Columbia, his beloved hometown and province. Uh, Neil, 
he was active for decades in the Vancouver cannabis activism or can activism scene, as we say, can activism, cannabis activism. Um, and Vancouver is sort of a hub globally of cannabis activism. I wouldn't say it's the, the main spot, but it is one of the top main places in the world where cannabis activism and change happens. And uh, it has been that way for many, many years. And Neil has been a part of the reason for that. Um, he came along shortly after Mark Emery in the early days. Um, he, you, know, he could, you could say he's one of the OGs of <laughs> cannabis activism. And uh, he had a lifelong career in it. He, when I asked him about how he got into it, he told me when he learned about the truth about cannabis and um, even the, the medicinal value of it and the way it can be used as food and so on. And he learned what a food, you know, horrible uh, medicinal shortage we go through in the world. People are lacking health care and people are lacking food everywhere in the world. And when he learned that this one plant could significantly change that, he knew he had to spend the rest of his life fighting against the prohibition of that plant. So major respect, major, major respect. Um, so he had a varied career. I can't even tell you everything that he's done, but I'll, a few highlights that I'm aware of is Neil went on a cross Canada trip in uh, on rollerblades, I believe it was at first, uh, and in an old broken down vehicle or whatever. However, he could get across, he did. He was trying to raise awareness. He called it the Freedom Tour, and it was about cannabis freedom. Um, so, but. Cannabis was a more of a dirty word back in the early 2000s and so on. Even you just, you know, tried to avoid saying it in public, basically, unless people knew what you were talking about. You might say 420 instead or something else in the code because it was that just more and more illegal back then. As the further you go back, the worse the prohibition was. And these people have been changing that. And um, so the Freedom Tour um, happened in 2006 and seven, I think it was. And then he went again in 2012 with Bert Easterbrook, another um, good friend and fellow uh, connectivist. Um, rest in peace, Bert. Died a couple of years ago. Um, they went across the country together for a, uh, like a rehash of the tour and in 2012 and uh, raised a lot of awareness, um, changed a lot of people's hearts and minds and met with mayors and police stations and everything all across Canada. And, talking about why cannabis should not be prohibited the way it is and how we need to change the laws and change how we police it and change how we, you know, the clogged courts and the ruined lives and every, all that stuff that needed to be changed and still does need to be changed. Even though we have legalization, we don't have true cannabis freedom. We don't have a free market. We, it's just a controlled government corporate monopoly. So, and cannabis culture was the big um, activism scene back then, and Neil did have an association with them, although he wasn't necessarily, um, as far as I know, employed by them or anything like that, but he did have a, a friendship with almost everybody there, and he worked with them a lot. And uh, so he was cannabis culture associated for sure. And um, one of his, um, later on, um, his crowning achievement, I think a lot of people would probably say, of his cannabis activism career was the Cannabis Substitution Project, the CSP. And uh, how that started was um, in about 2006 and 16 and 17, I was doing uh, something called the 420, uh, Vancouver 420 Farmers Market, and that was a cannabis market on Robson Street. Uh, started on just on Saturday, then it spread to basically all, every day of the week. It was like an outdoor dispensary. Um, and Neil put up a booth at that, and it was the Cannabis Substitution Project booth that he ran there at the market when he was also doing um, weekly giveaways at, I think it was called Vandu or something, another location in Vancouver, and he was giving away cannabis to anybody who wanted to substitute it for hard drug use. So if you were a hard drug user, if you were at risk of overdose, if you were an addict, or if you were just thinking about becoming a user of those hard street drugs and stuff, he would give you free cannabis. And it was good quality cannabis. And he would give away bud, he'd give away extracts, he'd give away oils and edibles even, and stuff that people couldn't even get in anywhere. Not even medical patients were able to get some of this 
products. And so he was kind of doing that project while I was doing the farmer's market and uh, that's how that, and then the farmer's market got shut down with legalization, but Neil, the cannabis substitution project did not get shut down. So he was able to continue doing that project and he's done it ever since. And, you know, amazing. He's, I don't know how many tens of thousands of people he's helped. Literally, you know, the, the opioid um, crisis, you know how many people it's killing. You know how many people it's killing. Neil is one of the people that's trying to reduce that number and has been reducing that number significantly, saving people's lives and um, improving people's lives and healing the community. He did so much good with that project. It's amazing. And uh, I'm glad to hear that it will continue after he's gone. That's excellent. They're even trying to start that up in other cities, so awesome. Um, I have a link below to an interview I did with Neil um, I don't know, about five years ago where I asked him a bunch of questions about the Cannabis Substitution Project and he talked about it and his views and stuff. So if you want to have a look at that, uh, it's down below. Um, Neil was very libertarian. Uh, I don't know if he ever described himself that or, uh, that way or not, but he that's how I would say he was. He was focused on liberty, basically. Just the idea that you don't harm other people and they don't harm you. And you don't stop people from doing what they want and you don't make people do what they don't want to do. That was the, the core of his beliefs. And um, he would speak a lot about public servants. He loved that term, like he, police and government. They'd say, are you public servants? Are you here to keep the peace? Are you here as a public servant? Or are you here to cause violence and chaos and to, and to obviously not serve us, just take our money and abuse us? He, you know, he, he was, you know, he was soft-spoken in a way, but he was also outspoken. He wouldn't hold his tongue. And um, he would he would tell you or anybody how he felt, um, but he was an incredibly nice guy. And um, I don't know if nice is the right word, but um, uh, <laughs> Neil was famous for singing "Oh Cannabis," and "Oh Cannabis" is um, it's a take on "Oh Canada." Obviously, uh, it's not meant to be disrespectful in any way. Neil was very pro-Canada. In fact, he was a proud Canadian. Uh, he didn't like the cannabis laws here, obviously, and he was trying to change that, but that's what O-Cannabis was all about, was pointing out, you know, this is the home of the free, but we don't have true freedom if you can't use a, pl a plant that you can grow in your backyard and use for medicine or for recreation. That's not hurting anybody else. If, if a, an adult can't do that, then are you free? So that was one of his points. And Oh Cannabis is a song that kind of makes that point. And he would sing it at, on Cannabis Day, but he would also sing it at, you know, on 420, on, even on the big stage in front of tens of thousands of people and you know, hundreds of thousands on the internet as well. He would be up there singing Oh Cannabis. Um, he, and he became famous for it. Um, he was the one who wrote the lyrics and came up with it, so. Um, now, Neil was, as part of the Cannabis Substitution Project, they actually had a van, like a, a mobile location that they were selling out of as well. And they, it got, eventually it got raided. He parked it right by the police station in downtown Vancouver, believe it or not, like within a block, and was running it there for years before they finally came and said, knock, 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 you know, like, what are you doing? We were selling weed or giving away and selling weed uh, to people, cannabis, people that need it. And they knew exactly. And then they're, okay, there you go. He's admitted it, take him in, charge him. So uh, he finally got charged, and that was actually his point, which is what he was trying to do that entire time. And he wanted to testify because he knew that he could challenge the laws and do a constitutional challenge. He had the lawyers ready to go. The cannabis lawyers in our community are really good. He had uh, friendships with them ready to go. And um, he wanted to come up against this, and he wanted to you know, expose this fake legalization. And um, you know, he almost made it to that trial. It was getting closer and closer, but he didn't ever get to uh, to say what he wanted to say. He he did all that, and then did not make it to that trial. So unfortunately, he won't be able to testify. And that's really what the whole the charges were about. And he that's why he did it so close to the police station. But. Um, he, he, Neil had a new, you know, numerous other projects. I don't even know them all. He was the uh, host on Pot TV, uh, like a, 
um, weekly, I think it was, broadcast or bi-weekly, um, all around the internet, a lot of people watched it. Um, uh, he was a great communicator. He was known for that, an orator, um, articulate, a master public speaker. Um, anytime the media came, he, it would be him that would be put in front of the media to talk. Uh, he had like a deep, it was a soft-spoken, but a you know a deep, strong voice that you wanted to listen to, and he chose his words properly. And he, you know, it wasn't flowery speech or anything. He just had a way of saying, making excellent points and putting it in terms that the person you he was talking to would understand, and um, high charisma level. And uh, yeah, and he so, but he was all that. But he was very outspoken. He had a lot to say. And uh, so what a great combination that makes. So he was an excellent public speaker. He did the eulogies and tributes and s such for other activists that, uh, you know, funerals and stuff that I've been to in the cannabis activism community over the past 10 years. He was doing the speeches uh, for most of those, too. So he, that was his, uh, his weapon. His main strength was his voice. Not the voice itself necessarily, but the way he used it and the uh, the message he had and the words that he spoke and the way he did it to um, change people, change people's minds, um, and teach people and educate people. Um, Neil supported my projects, um, like the Vancouver 420 Farmers Market. He would help, you know, he would share it and promote it on his. Um, back when I had Facebook, uh, he would share my, my, my event page and my comments and posts about it and whatever on all social media and um, uh, what else? BC Bud Day was another event that I created. He helped to get that off the ground and beca make it become a yearly part of the uh, Vancouver cannabis activism scene. Um, you know, even one-time protests that I organized, he would be there, and he would not only be there, but he would bring people, and he would ask other, you know, he would message them and ask them, are you coming? And uh, He was an absolutely a team player, one of the best team players that I met there. He was a high-profile activist and a high-profile person in Vancouver, and yet he had time for just about anybody who wanted to talk to him or wanted to start a project with him or anything like that, he would make time. He was very busy, but he made time. Um, at one point, I traded him my van, uh, which I wasn't able to drive anymore, <laughs> for some weed. <laughs> he had, he was going to these uh, conferences and getting these like really cool, like it was like not conferences, but like weed, like competitions basically, where all these craft growers were getting together with this amazing bud and. and uh, doing, they were judging it and stuff, and he was a, one of the judges at all these things, and he would bring some of it to me, and, uh, because Medicaid needed, um, needed it for pain and nerve problems and stuff, so, um, I was getting it, that from him, and he got my van. I don't know, I don't know exactly who got the better deal there, I, I think the van might have been worth a little bit more, um, but hey, uh, after a little while, I just said to him, you know what, let's just call it even, that's <laughs> that's good. And much activism was done with that van, he, and he also drove it to, like, Winnipeg a couple of times and stuff, so I'm glad he got good use out of that, and um, just another part of our lives that's intertwined, and um, in fact, we even almost moved in together, I think it was about 2016 or something, I don't even want to tell you this story about that, but it involved some... Okay, and a business from the Middle East, basically, and uh, a possible place to live and stuff like that, and we looked into it, and then we decided, <laughs> better not. But we almost lived together. We That was, would have been an interesting experience to live with Neil, but it didn't happen. Um, uh, he actually helped, or offered anyway, to um, set me up with a dispensary in 2016. I was interested in dispensaries, and dispensaries were a big thing in Vancouver that before legalization. It was the gray market dispensaries still. You know, you, it, you had to deal with the police possibly coming and shutting you down at any moment uh, because it technically wasn't legal on all levels, but um, you could have a dispensary in Vancouver, and I just about did operate a dispensary. Uh, Medicaid was going to be the uh, bud tender, and I was going to be the manager, and 
Uh, I, that was a busy time in my life and I was just getting sick um, with my nerve problems, so I was not able to open the dispensary with Neil. Um, now, if you are not in activism, in fact, I don't even know if this is a general activism term or just cannabis activism, but of course the, the it's a subculture and all cultures have their own terminology and in activism there is the term general, and a general is someone who is not an activist, not just an activist, but it's an activist who can create and does create new activists. So it's a very powerful, obviously, type of activist, and there aren't very many generals out there, but it's a person that who basically can turn regular people into, you know, activate people and make, make them passionate and get them into, you know, taking actions to, um, toward their cause. And in our case, the cause was to end bad prohibition laws against cannabis. We wanted true freedom. And he was, Neil was not just a general, but he was a general of generals. And I don't even know if anyone has, <laughs> has ever been described that way before, but there are people like that, certainly. People who can create people who then go out there and generate activism and activists all around them. So he was a general of generals. And Neil was creating people and, and bringing up people and empowering people like me and Medicaid. He took us under his wing. And he created generals out of us who have gone on to create other activists. Neil was a general of generals. Salute to you, Neil. Salute to you. I remember when I first got into activism, actually, now all these stories are going to be out of order, aren't they? But anyway, when I first got into it on the ground, like in the, on the you know, on the street, in 2015, when I'd been doing it online for years before that, but when I first got onto the street and I met Neil in person, all that kind of stuff, I remember one of the first conversations I had with him was, you know that most of the activism in Vancouver and the cannabis activism has already been done? <laughs> he said that. He said, he basically said, prohibition against cannabis is almost dead. It has maybe one more little roar and then it will be gone forever. And, um, Neil is known for his optimism. I'm known for my pessimism, I guess you could say. We both just consider ourselves to be realists, but um, I, Neil is very, very positive, over positive, in fact, sometimes, I think. And that teaches me about myself, too, because I know that maybe, I know I am too negative sometimes. And I'm going to try not to be. Um, but he thought that most of the activism had been done at that point, and Medicaid and I said to him, I, we fear that this legalization that is in the works and that is coming soon in the next couple of years from Justin Trudeau is not going to be real legalization. We think it's going to be a corporate monopoly. We think that there's just going to be still more punishments against people that are peacefully growing plants in their yards and using medicine, using whatever recreational weed in their yard by themselves, not hurting anyone else, not involving anyone else. We think it's still going to keep on happening. And he was, you know, he said, I respectfully disagree with you. I think we've, you know, we've basically wrapped it up. He wasn't trying to be boastful or anything. He would just, there had been many, many years, many decades, in fact, of work done at that point. And it's true. There, I wasn't even there for all of that. And he's right. Most of the work had been done. But he wasn't right that Prohibition only had one more roar because it's still going today. And he knew that. Um, and he was still continuing to fight it right up to his last day. Um, 2015, um, the Cannabis Day Riot, that was the very first day that I, you know, met Neil in person and see, saw, you know, saw, <laughs> laid eyes on the man other than at, like, events where he was up on stage and I just saw him and, you know, n knew him from the introductions and the speeches he gave and stuff, but now I actually got to interact with him and he was at Cannabis Day 2015 in Vancouver, and that was a day uh, of infamy. There was a riot that day, and literally a hundred people fist fighting and wrestling with the police. The Vancouver Police Department showed up at our Cannabis Day and instigated a riot. Now, Neil also was an instigator because he was selling cannabis and doing it openly. He was selling joints. I don't know. 
I, I think I, I wasn't close enough to see at that point. I didn't see what he was up to, but I heard later he was selling joints. That, and that's pretty common for Neil. What he, that's civil disobedience was one of his things. If it's illegal to do, and if it's wrong, and if it's wrong that it's illegal, then you do peaceful public breaking of those laws to show that it can be done without harming anyone. And so he was selling to other consenting adults. Here's a joint for five bucks or whatever. And the police, you know, surrounded him and said, if you keep doing that, we're going to arrest you for it. And he said, great, there we go. Let's bring it on. We can, we'll have, uh, we'll have a court date. And, uh, so we did, kept on doing it. And then there, there was a fight. There was a massive fight because, it, um, activists went into, uh, what's called hug power mode. And, uh, the, uh, there was a lot of high-profile, long-time activists there that day, and so the police had a huge battle on their hands trying to arrest this one man for selling a joint. And it was, yeah, I'll put my link down below because I was there, I recorded the entire thing. And uh, I got some really good footage of that. I did not get the actual arrest of Neil, but got him, you know, them all being dragged off finally, once the crowd finally was like beaten back by the police. Yeah, that was pretty bad. Charges were later dropped course. Um, after another couple of years of court cases and lawyer fees and all that kind of stuff and stress, sleepless nights and all that kind of stuff, and they dropped the charges. Um, yeah. Ah, uh, Neil helped me move in 2016 when uh, after my grandma died and I got really sick. My neurological condition suddenly showed up and um, he was there for me when I was sick when not a lot of other people were. So I appreciate him for that. Remember I was even hard up for some clothes at one point. I said, man, I, I'm so sick I can't even get out to the store and my clothes are worn out. I don't have a lot of clothes. He brought me over a bunch of shirts. They're cannabis day shirts. <laughs> Bright red, <laughs> it says cannabis day in the front from past years that he had, you know, volunteered and had extra shirts or something like that left over. So <laughs> I still have a bunch of those that I wear. Um, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, he was there for, for me and Medicaid when I first got sick and when he did help moving, helped us get settled in, uh, in our place in Burnaby there, New West. And, um, then Medicaid, well actually it was before that, Medicaid and I help, had helped him move in uh, 2015. And <laughs> there's a funny story about that one too, of course. Um, Neil was talking to some police who showed up while we were trying to move his stuff. I don't know why the police showed up. It wasn't weed related. It wasn't cannabis related at all. It was something to do with the move. Like someone had called the police for something or thought that we were stealing something maybe or something. I can't remember. But anyway, the police, the fucking Vancouver police show up. What are you, you know, what are you guys all doing here? Who are you? What is your names? Get, get, in fact, get, pull out your ID and then Neil, okay, Neil steps forward. He's like, excuse me. And of course, it was me, Medicaid, and a few other activists that Neil had you know, rounded up to help him move. And he goes, basically, he waves his hand, and then the guy's eyes glaze over, and Neil waves his hand, and Neil says, these are not the activists you're looking for. Basically, maybe not in those words, but, he, you know, he said, I think I remember him saying something like, these are hardcore cannabis activists. You will not get any identification from them, not even a first name. And he looks at us, and I think he was talking to us, actually, like reminding us of how to deal with the situation. And the cop looks over at us and looks back at Neil, and he's like, okay. And it, he just became a pussycat, and it wound, totally wound down from there. Neil wrapped him around his finger and then sent him back off to his car and drove away. And the other thing I remember about that is, though, is that when he called me a cannabis activist, I felt so proud to be called that by him. Mad respect for Neil Magnuson. Mad, mad, huge respect, if you can't tell. Um, in fact, I met Mark Emery before I met, Mar before I met Neil, and I never ended up becoming friends with Mark. I knew him, I've, I've known him since then, um, but we never really got to be friends, Neil and I did. I and mean, it's funny because when I met Mark, um, I hadn't met Neil yet, and it, 
I went into Mark's shop, Cannabis Culture, and he, there he was just talking to anybody about cannabis that would listen. So I started talking to him and listening, and we, he identified me kind of as an intellectual or somebody worth, you know, he had that way of trying to seek out certain people with a similar brain. And so he started bouncing ideas off me and seeing what I thought about certain things. And I remember one of the things he asked me was, have you read, have you read um, Anne Rand or something like that? And I'm like know what you know it's on the on the bookshelf or whatever to get to or whatever and he, he didn't like that that I hadn't read it and he's like you know what he kind of dismissed me almost he kind of said basically he said you're a lot like Neil Magnuson do you know who that is and I said yeah I know him online I'm, and I haven't met him in person yet and he said okay yeah you should talk to Neil <laughs> and I was a little insulted but you know what now I'm not now I'm <laughs> honored by that. I'm proud that somebody would say that I'm a lot like Neil Magnuson. So, he was a close personal friend, um, a mentor, like I said before, a hero. And I only said that about three or four people in my whole life. I loved seeing him visibly proud of me after a good speech. I'd put down the microphone, turn away from the crowd, and I remember looking, and sometimes I would look, you know, find Neil's face like it was my dad or something, and uh, see him just visibly proud, and that was uh, a highlight for me. Neil was filled with positivity, just filled with it, optimism and positivity. Live your life, he would say, you know, slow down, live life. He'd say, whatever you do, you got to try and do it with a smile. Do whatever you do with a smile. And he would also say, he'd say, listen to your gut, or, or trust your gut, listen to your heart. Such basic ideas, you know, like, you think that, no, oh, that's something that they'd say on a Hallmark card or something. He was absolutely right. He was right about all those things. It doesn't need to be any more complicated than that, does it? Neil didn't want to die, but in my opinion, he did feel that he had enjoyed the life that he had been given to that point. And he was happy with the things that he did manage to accomplish. And I believe that he hopes and believes that some of his projects and goals will continue on after him, and I think they will. I know they will. I spoke on the phone to Neil. Turns out it was just before he died, maybe a couple of days before he died. I didn't obviously know at the time, um, but um, when he did die, I, I thought back, oh my that was, he died just after I spoke to him. And um, when I had spoken to him, he had been positive, actually. He didn't sound very good to me. He, he didn't sound very strong. He sounded small. Um, but he wanted to live to testify at his trial. It's um, what he felt was his, maybe was going to be one of his final achievements was to testify at his trial. And um, he wanted to see Cannabis Day today. He wanted, you know, he said, I don't think I'm going to be able to sing <laughs> because of his throat, but uh, he wanted to, to see it. He wanted to be there. He wanted to make it. So he wasn't planning on, on dying when he did, um, but uh, he, wanted, he wanted to live. But he was happy with what he had accomplished. I don't think he, you know, I can't speak for the man, but I don't. I believe he had a lot of regrets. He wanted to see me in August. Um, a couple months from now I'm going to be going down to Vancouver to get some surgery on my heart and he wanted to see me then. So he was planning on being around. Um, now apparently at the last uh, Neil gave everybody a thumbs up. He was with his surrounded by his close friends, his son, fellow activists, and they said that he gave them the thumbs up and he said, 
it's okay. And he gave them a smile. That was as much as he could muster. That was about the last of Neil. And I guess to Neil, I just want to say thank you, Neil. You're right, it is okay. And um, I want to say congratulations, Neil. Katie sends her love as well. And, uh, she loves the hugs that you gave her. She'll cherish every one of those memories, of those big hugs you gave her. Until we meet again, Neil. Rest easy, brother. Not sure yet. 418. 418. So I got a couple more minutes. And that's cool, because I got lots to say always. You know? This this is about way more than just cannabis, our favorite plant that we all know should never have been criminalized in the first place. For me and for many of our fellow activists, this whole thing is about freedom and what it means to be in a so-called free country, in a, in a democratic country, and have public servants and not have some dictator or tyrant or queen or king or somebody that gets to you know tell us what to do and what not to do. And our forefathers have struggled for a long time to get out from underneath the thumbs of these people, these financially elite people of this planet that live in some different world than we live in, that don't consider human ethics in their business. They don't even think we're human. We're just part of the, the money stream that they can take advantage of. It's only them and their families and their friends that are the real humans, and they fly around in their jets, and they make all these laws, and they subject us to their monopolies, and they exploit us every chance they get. But it's wrong, and it's always been wrong, and, and, and good people have been fighting against this inequity and this injustice for a very long time. And we've managed to get to where we are here, where we have, you know, at least by facade, some sort of a free-ish uh, free country, and we have sort of public servants that aren't really dictators and tyrants except for the time they're in office and that sort of stuff. But we can be here, we can do this, and we can keep fighting, and that's what we need to do, and that's why I thank all of you people for being here and helping us with this fight, even though right now what you're doing is criminal, the cops can come in at any moment and arrest us all, but here we are, we're brave and we're right. And yeah. we're so thanks for that. And it's 4.20, Woo. Krispy Kreme time, apparently Jerry, I can't do that. <laughs>